This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman, talking to Steve Cole, two-time Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist, wrote for The Washington Post for many years, managing editor there, now writes for The New Yorker magazine. His latest book is The Bin Ladens, An Arabian Family in the American Century. I asked him to describe how the Bin Ladens were flown out of the United States. There were three groups of Saudis in the United States at the time of 9-11 that the Saudi government decided it should evacuate. Uh, two of them were essentially groups of royal family members uh, that happened to be on vacation. One of them was in, one of the groups was in Las Vegas, another was in Kentucky buying thoroughbred horses, and then there was the Bin Laden family, uh, which had a number of members of Osama's generation, perhaps four or five brothers and sisters, um, I'd have to count them, one, two, three, at least four. Uh, five brothers and sisters who were in the United States, and their, some of their children and some cousins and so forth all scattered around the United States in L.A., Florida, D.C., and Boston. And the initial inquiries that were made by the Saudi ambassador, Bandar bin Sultan, occurred as early as two or three days after 9-11 when airspace was shut down. But it's it's. It's a myth that the planes flew when all other planes were grounded. In fact, the planes flew at a time when airspace was opening up again. But the arrangements were made when everything was shut down and the authorization was given by the White House and by uh, the FBI. I mean, there are the descriptions of the Logan airport officials, those who ran Logan, being shocked when they were told that they were to bring this family onto a plane. Yes. Well, I mean, there was a lot of shock. It's a quite an amazing story, and uh, we were able to interview some security guards that were assigned to this. They, they, rent, they leased a plane that was used for sports teams. It had, like, a special configuration and a, and a, round, and a bar, <laughs> and uh, they flew the plane out to Los Angeles to pick up the first of the bin Ladens, uh, actually a remarkable woman, one of his uh, sisters, who was a pilot there, lived a very sort of L.A. lifestyle. She was distraught. and had gone into Bullock's with her credit card and been screamed at by the clerks and just wanted to get out, even though she really uh, had nothing to do with Osama and his ideology. And so they put her on the plane, and she's the only passenger, and they have one security guard, and they're going to fly from L.A. to Orlando to pick up some other family members. And they're up in the air, and the security guard goes up into the cockpit, and he says to the pilot, uh, you know, how's it going? And it comes, it becomes clear to him that the pilot doesn't know that he's going to be flying bin Laden's. So the security guard figures, well, I better tell him he's the pilot. So they, they, he explains that there's a bin Laden out there and there's going to be a whole bunch more bin Laden's coming aboard. Well, the crew revolts. They say, we're not flying bin Laden's. They're afraid. They demand more money. They go on strike on the tarmac in Orlando while other bin Ladens are milling around saying, you know, we need to get moving here. <laughs> and uh, the whole thing has were a kind of— Were they at Disney World? They were living in uh, a family, a bin Laden family compound just outside of Disney World called Desert Bear that had been uh, bought many years before by Osama's uh, adventurer, elder brother Salem. And, uh, so another brother, Khalil, was living there with his uh, Brazilian-born wife and some children uh, who, who were, they spent summers there, typically. And uh, so they were very, he showed up at the, Khalil showed up in a, in a designer suit and sunglasses and was very apologetic to the security guards and the pilots saying, you know, I'm really sorry that you have to do this, but, you know. We, we need to get moving. And there were some TV reports that something was happening at the airport, and the security cards started to get afraid that somebody was going to show up and start taking pot shots at them. And, and he's on the phone uh, with his uh, charter company trying to negotiate some new pay package for the pilots to get them to take off again. And it was, uh, it was a mess. Eventually, the, the family does come aboard, you know, in groups one group in Orlando, another in Washington, another in Boston, and it takes on this air by the accounts of people who are aboard of a sort of mournful family reunion, some people crying, some people uh, quietly reacquainting uh, because they hadn't seen each other in a while, and everybody smoking cigarettes, places are filling up with cigarette smoke. 
and uh, some of the college students complaining that they'd just gotten fake IDs and were, you know, now had, had no use for them in Saudi Arabia. I mean, it is. Uh, Why did President Bush authorize this? I mean, you think about the aftermath of September 11th and all that a president would have to deal with. And yet here he is involved with the logistics and not even bringing in intelligence or the FBI to question all well, of they, those. Well, they did bring in the FBI, in fairness, to question uh, just about everybody. I, in my, I, my assessment is that there, there may have been one person aboard that plane uh, who had been the subject of a previous an aborted FBI inquiry into a proselytizing organization that published uh, anti-Semitic materials out of Northern Virginia, not an organization that's ever been accused of participating in terrorist violence, but which had been, because of its radical uh, preaching materials, the subject of previous inquiries that had been shut down. So that person um, perhaps uh, was not interviewed. It's, it's a little bit difficult to tell from the documents that I've been able to obtain. But um, in any event, uh, to go to your question, why did the White House authorize this? Well, the White House, the counterterrorism director, Richard Clark, the director of the FBI, Louis Free, the president, they had, they had been conditioned by American foreign policy to have very close and cooperative relations with the Saudi royal family. Prince Bandar bin Sultan had extraordinary access to the White House. So he smoked cigars on the balcony of the White House with the president two days after 9-11. And, and Known the, as Bandar Bush. Bandar Bush, yes. Uh, and he had very close relations with the vice president, uh, Dick Cheney, dating back to the first uh, Gulf War in 1990. So it would have been natural to accommodate an urgent request from him saying, hey, these people are innocent, they're members of our government, we need to get them out. And so it, it almost happened without a second thought. I assume there have been lots of urgent requests at that point, given that 3,000 yeah. people had died and the Pentagon so. had been hit and the World Trade Centers were yes. down. Yes, you might think so. We're talking to Steve Cole. He is author of The Bin Ladens. And so afterwards, in this six-year period, um, uh, since almost seven years, since 2001 attacks, where is Bin Laden? How did he get around? Of course, if you could tell us, I guess you wouldn't be sitting yeah. here. But um, how significant is he today? I think he's uh, still of some significance. I think there are several aspects to that. Uh, he continues to make a lot of uh, video and audio tape statements in which he um, tries to hold on to a narrative line about the war he believes that he's waging and, and urge his followers in certain directions. He identifies uh, targets. He talks about the legitimacy of his cause in ways that uh, some people respond to in any event. And so it's not the only voice on the jihadi media networks, but it's, a, it's an important voice. How did he elude uh, the Americans in Afghanistan? And what is the role of Pakistan, the Pakistan government, military, intelligence services? Yeah, he, I think the last, uh, so far as I know, and it, it's possible that we'll learn more about things that have not come out since 9-11, but the last time the United States government had a clear angle to capture or kill him was in December of 2001, when he was up on the mountains of Tora Bora, and even by his own account that he's now put out on some of his video and audio statements, he was under bombardment and under a lot of pressure, thought he was at the end. He wrote a will, uh, and he was hunkered down. But uh, the American uh, military decided not to put its own troops on that hillside and used Afghan uh, militia forces that weren't uh, 